Okay. All right. Uh, before we start today, I want to remind you basically or highlight the main message of yesterday's lecture. Someone told me that he was brain dead after the lecture, so uh, maybe I should have shortened the lecture to this slide only. Uh, the idea, of course, of time dependent DMRG is to just uh, solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation efficiently. And we know that if we have a complete basis, we know the Hilbert space, we can do this exactly, we can do exact normalization, but of course we're going to be limited to small systems. People still do that, though. Like uh, Andreas Loki, he has some nice uh, studies of uh, relaxation. Um, but uh, if we want to study large systems, we need to use DMRG, we need to truncate the basis. So the premise is exactly the same. We want to just solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation, but uh, we need to do it in a truncated Hilbert space. So the main trick basically is how to do it in a way that we keep track of all the information as we evolve in time without missing any, any, any information about the ground state. Um, also, uh, another thing that we want to highlight is that what we have at a large time t is basically a very good representation of the, of the state. Right? That's what we are simulating. We're, we are following the state. Uh, so this concerns uh, questions uh, Barbara asked yesterday. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, another question that um, Barbara asked, and uh, I kept thinking about that, is um, can we guarantee that after we have a time, uh, a state at a you know large time t, um, that uh, the observables are going to be so the, the 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 quantities that we're going to measure are going to be also accurate. So we mentioned that we have our state at time t, and we want to measure some observable uh, acting on a side i, another acting on side j, something like that. Now we know that we are representing by following you know we have up to time dependent DMRG, we're representing this wave function, right? But that doesn't grant us that this wave function here is going to be well represented, right? Imagine that we calculate this plus is minus here. What tells us that, you know, the state after we flip the two spins is going to be the Hilbert space that we, we follow, right? So that, that's a subtlety. And we try not to think about that. We just think, okay, we have we have a good state, and we just measure uh, the observables with that state, and uh, that's going to be you know, as accurate as we we can if we get enough states. I, I um, understand. What, so why is it not? So you have a good representation of of We have a good representation of this, but now we apply S plus on on this. This is a local operator. Huh? This is a local operator. Yes. But the state that results from here maybe uh, have some important overlap with uh, some states outside the region that we could sample. Um, I mean, it's like uh, imagine that we're calculating some. Uh, uh, Correlation function uh, that mixes two two subspaces with different quantum numbers. Things like that. <laughs> so in, in, actually, this is not only a, pro, uh, a problem, a, a reason of concern with time-dependent DMRG. People talked about that, this uh, in the very beginning of DMRG. How you have to uh, calculate correlation functions, and some people suggested that we have to follow, you know, target this state and this state in the density matrix. So both states would be accurately represented. But uh, it turns out that uh, you don't gain much. Actually, DMRG takes care of everything pretty much. So, I'm sorry, uh, your OJ and OI at different times? Is that what you mean? Uh, not necessarily, no, at time two. Everything at uh, equal time. You can, <coughs> well, if you have this, 
acting at different times, definitely you have to follow the yeah. two, the two <laughs> states in the, at, at the same time. And that's what you do when you do um, time-dependent correlation functions. Yeah. And uh, Schroeder is going to talk about next week, so I don't want to touch that today. So another thing, uh, so the point is that if you follow the premise, if you follow all the, the steps that I described yesterday, and if you uh, if you're carefully taking into account all the sources of error and you're convinced that you have them under control, then independent uh, energy is as accurate as exact normalization, or as accurate as, as, as your truncation error and, and your Suzuki total error. And uh, so, what you the, the only problem, of course, is uh, entanglement. You can simulate relatively long times, but when the entanglement gets out of control, then you have to stop the simulation. And that's a problem that you don't have with exact analysis. All right, now I'm going to... Any questions about this? So I could have just spent five minutes in my lecture yesterday and go take the take break. Uh, but I wanted to explain all the technical details behind the time dependent DMRG, hoping that, you know, after learning all this, you'll be able to maybe implement your own code. Uh, actually, uh, this is something I need to mention also. Uh, tomorrow in the apps uh, tutorial, the hands-on tutorial, we're going to spend half an hour, maybe 40 minutes, maybe an hour or so, before we get into the apps part, to, um, showing um, about di dissecting a DMRG code. Okay? We're going to do it together. It's 100 lines. It's just matrix and vectors, multiplications, and very simple. Okay, uh, and I'm going to give you uh, this code. I don't know how to distribute this code. Uh, I can to, so to you. You can give us the code. We can post uh, it online. I'm going to give you a code and the make file. Uh, I'm going to show you how to compile. I'm going to go step by step with you, looking at the different parts of the code. And uh, we're going to run it. And, um, and then uh, Miles uh, is going to show uh, code uh, using uh, a tensor library that uh, Steve White developed, and uh, basically in a more matrix cross states uh, uh, from, from the MBS viewpoint. So similar, similar thing, but from a different perspective, and he's going to show you some of the tricks they use. So I think it's going to be fun, interesting. Unless you hate uh, coding, uh, so um, I'm going to be switching from one PowerPoint to another PowerPoint because uh, my uh, free trial uh, license expired, <laughs> and uh, I can only use the the viewer, but I cannot edit the files anymore. I have to use OpenOffice, and OpenOffice messes up everything and. Anyway, uh, so um, as I mentioned yesterday, there are many applications for time dependent DRG. Actually, uh, you can play many, many, many games. Uh, you can quench your system, you can apply perturbation, you can apply a, you know, a sun perturbation or a time dependent perturbation. Uh, you can um, couple your system to other degrees of freedom to see what happens, uh, for instance, and you can study the coherence, free reduction decay, and echo radio oscillations. And you can study quantum control by applying pulse sequences to see if you can uh, uh, increase the coherence, and this uh, applies to uh, controlling qubit systems and uh, uh, NMR kind of experiments. All right, so today, um, since Scholder is going to talk about some of these applications, in particular, he's going to talk about uh, evolution in imaginary time, so how to simulate temperature, and he's going to talk about uh, calculating spectral functions um, using, uh, you know, using time-dependent uh, correlation functions. Uh, I'm going to uh, focus on transport. <coughs> so today, we're going to talk a little bit about physics. He said it was pretty technical. Um, but before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the challenges we face when we do this kind of, uh, we study this kind of problems. 
So to illustrate that, I'm going to show you a simulation where we, uh, th this is just an experiment that I run for fun before Sherlock published a 15 page paper on, uh, on the same product. Uh, and um, so the, 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 the system we are simulating here is a spin chain, spin one half chain, and we are polarizing half of it one way and the other half in the opposite direction. So basically, we have half of the system polarized, all the spins pointing up. Um, the, the, on the left side, um, on the right hand side, we have all the spins pointing down. And this is a product state. This is totally unentangled. You can make a partition anywhere here along the chain, and you can write the state as a product state of the two halves. Uh, uh, one comment here is how do you prepare this state? This is not the ground state of the Heisenberg model. Right? This is a, a state that is totally a uh, mixture of uh, side states, if you want. So what we do is we take this Hamiltonian, um, minus h, sum on the left, uh, is the i plus h, sum on the right, is the i. Right? Very simple. So we take the Hamiltonian. We, we can do it easily in terms of metric plus state. This is trivial. Right? Or we can um, just put the states there and build our blocks uh, by keeping track of the states where we want to put them. But the, in, in general, in a very straightforward way to do this is take the Hamiltonian like this, and the ground state of this Hamiltonian is going to be basically that. Right? Uh, this is. Uh, uh, so the left side is going to want to polarize all the speeds in one direction and the right side in the other direction. So this is a totally artificial Hamiltonian that we used to initialize our state from. And uh, we do similar things in many situations. And once we obtain this state, this is the initial state. So the initial state doesn't have to be necessarily the ground state. And now what we do is we uh, evolve with the uniform Heisenberg chain. So that's the Hamiltonian we use for do the, to do the time And uh, you get something uh, that looks like this. You know, it's, uh, we have uh, basically two wavefronts propagating in opposite directions. And um, we can simulate very large times. Uh, if we plot the evolution in a sort of um, you know, position time uh, plane, we obtain something like this. This is the density, uh, the, the, the absolute value of the density, of the spin for SA. And, um, or something like this, depending on the anisotropy in the Hamiltonian. But I'm not going to focus into that, uh, on that. Uh, yes? That's what I'm going to talk about next. The, this is why I'm talking about it. So what we get here is a really nice uh, uh, light cone. Uh, so what we see here is that there is a, a perturbation originating in the center of the chain, and this perturbation is propagated in both directions with some velocity. Um, of course, we're going to assume that this velocity is going to be the, the spin wave velocity, or in, if, if you want to speak in terms of fermions, uh, the Fermi velocity, so the velocity of the Fermi level. It turns out that in reality, you know, we have a, a mixture of uh, states here. The, the, the initial state is uh, uh, basically a combination of excited states. And, um, and the wafer is going to propagate with the maximum possible velocity, not necessarily the, 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 the frame velocity. So we have a band that has a curvature. So we're going to propagate. If you're a half feeling, your frame velocity is the maximum velocity. So you don't care. But if you're away from that feeling, you're still going to propagate with the mass. But the point is that on the left side, the red part and the right part, the system is still in the product state. So what's going to happen is that uh, we're going to have a piece of the system that's going to be still all ups. And then this region inside the light cone is going to be totally entangled. And here they're going to be all down. 
So if you make the partition here, the tunnel is still zero. Or if you make the partition here, the tunnel between the two pieces is zero. But if you make a partition here, the two pieces are going to be highly entangled. So obviously, the entanglement is going to be somehow proportional to the the length of of this block, and it's going to grow in time. It's going to grow in time proportionally to the this velocity. Yes. So again, I can hear you. Delta, delta is a, um, it's a, it's, it's like an exit for uh, Z chain. So it's a, the, the Hamiltonian we're looking at here is, so this would be the XY chain. Uh, uh? So this is that's the XY. Z plus uh, delta over two. Um, S plus S minus plus. You must mean the delta on the Z. Um, maybe, maybe. Because delta equals zero. No. Yeah. Trivial, nothing right oh, yes, yes, you're totally right. Uh, you're right. Sorry. But that is here. That's So, I mean, um, as I mentioned, uh, Schoenberg has a paper where he discusses the difference between these two different regimes. Uh, this, uh, this delta equal one corresponds to the fully isotropic isolated chain, is too symmetric, and, and uh, has um, a diffusive behavior, and here we have ballistic behavior. Um, so let's continue talking about uh, entanglement growth. So entanglement growth is the enemy here. If we want to be able to efficiently simulate the time evolution, we need to be able to understand this one, how entanglement grows in time. And there are several theories. Actually, this is a very active uh, topic of research nowadays. Uh, many people work into these uh, kind of things, like Calvese, Cardi, Peschel. I'm sure I pronounced the name correctly. And uh, uh, Andreas Leutli has done some simulations studying this problem. So, um, we want to understand how this quantity behaves, so we can learn how to fight. So possible scenarios that we're going to face are a global quench, where basically we just, um, apply a perturbation that is non-local and acts on the entire volume of the system. We can have a local quench, which is acting only on one side, for instance, or a small region. Or we can have a periodic quench, which is basically um, sort of like a time-dependent pulse, if you will, or oscillating pulse. And, uh, and we can have an adiabatic quench, and that means that we smoothly uh, change some parameters in the time, or we apply the, uh, the perturbation that goes in time very slow. Um, so one observation, when we do a quench, a sudden quench, unless we are doing an adiabatic quench, all of, all of a sudden, we are no longer in the ground state. We are in some highly excited state, the high energy of the new Hamilton, right? And um, so there are many questions that arise when you have such a situation. For instance, is the system going to thermalize? It's going to uh, you know, relax and equilibrate some state? Is this state going to be described by some uh, statistical ensemble? Uh, how does this relate to integrability? If the system is integrable or non-integrable? This is also a very important question that people are working on. There have been some very interesting uh, developments recently, sorry, with some papers by Rigol and, um, and uh, Orshani and others. Uh, so this is a typical example. This is actually a simulation of the um, icing chain with the transverse field. This is a kind of uh, point model that people like to play with. And uh, this was done by Calabrese Cardi in 05, and I took it from their paper. And we see the entanglement as a function of time for different uh, partitions. So this is the length of the block, basically. And uh, we can neatly see here that the entanglement grows linearly in time, initially. And at some point, depending on the size of the block, it saturates. So if the block is uh, small, it saturates earlier. If the block is larger, 
saturates later. We can see that the point at which the system saturates is sort of proportional to the length. And the velocity of the propagation doesn't change. Of course, we expect that to be constant. How do we explain this? Uh, I want to give you a sort of very qualitative picture, kind of unwaving argument, although it's valid in reality and can be shown using conformal field theory in critical sequence. So let's assume that we have um, our system at T0 here and our system at T uh, at some later time here. And uh, we apply the quench at T equals 0. What happened? This is a global quench. So when we apply this sudden quench, so that sudden perturbation of the system, the picture that we have to keep in mind is that um, we are creating sort of um, like in the light cone that I showed before, sort of uh, quasi particle pairs or quasi particle excitations that uh, are paired or entangled. Not yeah, let's not say pair. Maybe entangled is the right word. That propagate in um, opposite directions. And uh, the entanglement between these two particles um, uh, doesn't change in time, uh, presumably, right? Uh, not necessarily, of course. So here we are sort of drawing the, the light cone for each of these entangled pairs. And uh, at some very time t, the width of the light cone is 2vt, right? And uh, what we see here is that this, this um, region here between, uh, uh, of length 2 bt is the only region that is actually entangled with the outside world. And the same here. Okay. So in a way we can see that uh, the, we, we, if we assume that the entanglement that grows uh, linearly in time, it will grow as 2 bt as the length of the, the, the piece of the system that is entangled with the outside. So I should have used uh, the velocity here, but it's a different constant. So this is what uh, we see from this picture, that the entanglement grows linear, linearly in time. Now let's um, keep evolving <coughs> to a darker time. And now the light cones are wider, right? 2vt for a larger time now it spans all, all the system and beyond. So we see that the entire system is entangled with the outside wall. But the number of pairs that are entangled is not going to grow in time. It's going to stay constant. And uh, that, uh, that explains why it's subjects, why the entanglement is subjects. So now let's contrast this with the picture for local quench. For local quench, we apply perturbation here, some localized points and in the center of the chain, for instance, the same as we did uh, before. And uh, now the system, we're going to see a light cone. And I, I used a different picture here. I used um, I, I took a system on on the left and region A on the left and region B on the right for illustration. I think it's better to intuitively understand what's going on. Now, what, what's happening here is that the region of length L prime here is going to be entangled with the right side, while the rest is going to be, to be totally disentangled. And we know basically this. These pairs are basically splitting the, the whole system into three pieces. So, as I said before, hope you all can see, we're going to have this region. This region is entangled, and this region is not. Right? So, this is in a pair state, up, 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 for instance. And this is also in a pair state, down, 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 down. So, in reality, when we look at the entanglement, we're looking at this, peaks. This piece doesn't continue. So we look at this vision here. <laughs> What's an explicit example of this? I'm confused. Uh, there must be interactions out in the uh, region and for something to propagate. In the, well, it's like we're taking on, uh, let's imagine we have a, 
uh, an icing chain and we apply no an icing chain. Let's think. Uh, so let's imagine we have two disconnected chains and we turn on the hopping. So at this zero they are disconnected and we but it, but you've drawn it up there as if it was a product state out at infinity, whereas you don't necessarily mean that. Yes, yes, yes. It's just whatever the initial ground state. Right, right, right. Okay. But this is just a sort of the toy picture. Okay, so you turn on a coupling between the two. Mm -hmm. And now the, the entanglement is going to grow in this region. And now we make a partition here. And this is kind of uh, what um, Matt Hastings told you a uh, few days ago. If we look at the entanglement of this piece now, take this piece A with this piece B, <coughs> what we're going to see from conformal field theory is that the entanglement is going to grow as the log of the prime, basically. Where this is, this is L prime. This length is L prime. So we see that uh, in local quench, the entanglement between the two subsystems is going to grow as um, log of L prime, and L prime is V times T. Right? This is uh, actually this only is for a critical system, or that's more general. This is uh, for a critical system, yeah. This is from performance we can see this. Uh, but in general, sort of, kind of uh, follows nicely uh, for that system. At least in small blocks, I think. Um, so, uh, and this is uh, log of uh, B times T. So we see that the time basically grows as a log of Um, so, to summarize what I just mentioned, for a global quench, we expect that the entropy is going to, the time entropy is going to grow uh, proportional to the time. And how that this translates to, how does it translate to, to computational cost? Uh, the computational cost in VMRG is measured by the number of states that we need to keep, right? And we know that the number of states is sort of uh, proportional to the exponential of the internal entropy. So that means that the number of states will grow exponentially in time. And that's something that we've seen already in the previous slides last year and at lecture. Now, if we do a local quench, uh, the entropy is going to grow as a uh, log of t. That means that the number of states is going to grow as t to some constant. So it's going to grow, poly it's going to be polynomial in time. And that's good, you know, because it uh, means that, you know, uh, gives us some hope to, to be able to control uh, the errors uh, for, for local questions and go to larger time uh, intervals. And then, of course, something that I didn't uh, talk about is an in, in, enigmatic quench. An uh, enigmatic quench is when you basically move slightly, um, very smoothly in time, very slowly in time compared to the time scales in the system. And we know that enigmatic perturbation. Uh, the, the system, the ground state follows the perturbation. So the system is basically always in the ground state. So we're hoping that the complexity is going to be the same as in ground state. Energy. So we can do this. This is nice. Um, and uh, the other uh, thing that I'm not going to discuss is, for, um, you know, for the questions. But this, this is a good um, um, summary of uh, what we should expect when we do time, time evolution. All right, now I'm going to talk about, um, yes? Um, now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit of uh, uh, physics, if you will. And uh, describe the, the application of the tender to the energy to uh, transport in nanostructures, for instance. And, uh, this was actually um, maybe one of the main motivations behind time dependent energy at the time. Because, uh, well, time dependent energy originated in two different uh, 
So territories, uh, quantum information on one side, and condensed matter on the other side, sort of simultaneously. And there was a sort of a cross breeding between the two fields. But the motivation in the, in the condensed matter community was more focused towards studying transport. Now, of course, we know that we can do a lot of neat things we call atoms. Uh, so most of the effort now is uh, uh, forking in that direction. And uh, people in the quantum information territory um, are more interested in things like dissipation, normalization, and quantum information kind of questions, entropy. Uh, but um, when we uh, when we um, actually the first attempt to do time dependent image, if you recall, was from Casalilla and Marston, and um, they tested the model, uh, then sorry, the algorithm uh, using uh, a, a transport problem, basically transport through a tunnel environment. And uh, so uh, here I'm going to talk about that problem and generalizations of you know this application to other more complicated problems. And uh, uh, this is um, uh, something that uh, started in 2006, maybe earlier. I mean, uh, there are a series of papers where we sort of um, improved on, on the original proposal. Uh, so I want to thank all the, my collaborators in most of these papers, uh, Fabian Heidi Meisner, uh, Khaled Hassania, who's here, uh, Carlos Busser, who's my postdoc now, uh, George Martins, Elvio Dagoto, Luis Da Silva, and Enrique Anda in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it's nice to have collaborators in Rio. Um, <laughs> uh, we did a big trip uh, the other year. Uh, um, so, Let's look at the, 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 the formulation of the problem. We're going to start from the simplest possible scenario. We're going to take uh, two leads, one dimensional leads, one to the right, one to the left, and uh, they're, going, they're connected by a weak link. Uh, so we have hoping T here, hoping T here, uh, hoping TQ is smaller than T, and we apply bias here between the two leads at T0. So we start from some equilibrium state, say the ground state of the system. That's not necessarily, uh, I mean, that's not a necessary ingredient. You can start from any arbitrary state, actually. I'm going to talk about that later. And then you apply a bias. And, and you measure the current in time. So uh, first I'm going to say that we simplify it even further the problem by using speed experiments. But we added interactions in the lead, so this is kind of like an XXZ Hamiltonian uh, in terms of spins or spinless frames with near neighbors uh, attraction. Uh, the main motivation behind this is studying this problem is that it's deeply connected to the behavior of the edge states in quantum holes, <coughs> fractional holes. Um, so this is actually working collaboration with um, Paul Fendi and Matthew and Chet and I. So what we do is we start from initially the graph state, and then we can punch the system by applying this bias. This bias means that we put a chemical potential uh, delta mu on the left, and then minus delta mu on the right, for instance, something like that. And uh, that's the perturbation. And we evolve using the Hamiltonian, including this perturbation. And what you see is that, of course, charge is going to start flowing from the left to the right. And you measure the current as a function of time. And you see that, you know, initially you have a transient. The current evolves uh, towards some uh, plateau. And this plateau describes a sort of quasi steady state. We have a fine system. We don't expect to see a steady state. But we have a, a, you know, a range of time in which the system behaves pretty similar to what you expect in a steady state. Is this 
This is integral mode. This is integral. This is an integral mode. So you can solve it with beta ansatz. Yes. So you can solve it with beta ansatz. Uh, so let me just comment here. What you expect to have is um, actually this was uh, first solved by um, Fisher and Kane. So this is a famous Kane and Fisher one. And uh, you expect the conductance to be proportional to uh, G uh, e squared over H, where G is the Lattinger parameter for the chain. And it turns out that you can, ex since it, uh, we, have, we know the beta ansatz solution, we can extract uh, G uh, from the beta ansatz solution for any value of the interactions in the leads. We can fine tune our model to the edge theory for the quantum fold space that we want. So that's really neat. So once we fine tune uh, G and the interactions for that G, we study the, the transport problem. And here I'm showing two um, approaches. The first one is by just uh, using, uh, you know, just applying bias. And we see that first the current evolves towards uh, some value. <coughs> we reach a sort of quasi steady state. And then, since we are in a finite system with open boundary conditions, the wavefront is going to bounce back. So the perturbation is going to reach the boundaries of the system, and the current is going to start flowing the opposite direction. And we see that reversal of the current. That, so there are two things that limit our ability to measure here. One is the basically the length of the transient uh, because we want to reach a steady state, and the other one, of course, is the length of the steady state before before it bounces back. So we control these things, but well, the transient we cannot control. It only depends on the, the, the separation of the energy levels in the near the Fermi level. Uh, but we can control the the length of the plateau. You see a couple of tricks. One, of course, the most obvious one is to use a large system. And the second, less obvious, is to use damped boundary conditions. Damped boundary conditions means that you gradually reduce the hopping in the leads as you reach the boundaries. And somehow the trap is, the, the, the charge is going to get trapped. And it's not going to bounce back. Eventually it will bounce back, but it will take longer. So you can see here that the plateau is much longer. We don't see the, the wave packet bounce. So this gives us a, a nice knob to sort of play with. And, uh, and once we reach the plateau, we take a region, say that we, we consider three uh, steady, such as here, and we measure in that interval. We do an average the current. And you see some little fluctuations. So this average is going to have some error bars. So it's important to take these error bars into account when you publish this. Okay? Uh, all right. So now we, we know the current as a function of voltage or bias. And we can plot the ID curves, uh, the IDB, and so on. Uh, here I'm showing the case for for this particular problem, I'm showing um, I divided by D voltage uh, as a function of the voltage. And the dots correspond to, the symbols correspond to 10 and 10 DMRG. And the curves, the red curves, are beta ansatz. So as I said before, this integral mode was, it was done by Ludwig and others. That's Ludwig. And we know the equations, the beta ansatz equations, which is so the integrals, we can extract i as much of v. And we see a very, very nice agreement up to this voltage. And then the dependent gear machine starts curving down. You see that? And this has a very straightforward and reasonable explanation. In the time dependent gear machine, we're using a lattice model. Lattice model has a minus 2t cosine k dispersion, if you will which has a curvature. And the integral model solved with the ansatz has a flat dispersion, so constant density of states. And um, 
that's uh, so the curvature of the band is responsible for the curvature of the of the current, and that's a behavior that's also seen in quantum knots and other systems that we study. Of course, these voltages where you start seeing the, the curvature are really really large voltages in terms of you know Fermi energy or temperature. So the region of interest is basically small and intermediate voltages and. Um, so one observation also that uh, we can start from here is that we are not limited by linear response. We know that many of the mechanical tools that uh, people use are limited to linear response. Here we can study out of equilibrium uh, or large biases. And then uh, the DMRG has a very nice behavior at large biases. So um, basically, as you see here, the basically mm, Maybe not in this example, but the, the, the transient tends to be shorter as we increase the balance. It's not that obvious. So now we can um, move on and study a more complicated problem that is non integral. For instance, we can use these interacting leads as before, but put an impurity in between. And the fermions can hop to this impurity and, uh, with amplitude TQ. And again, we can tune the leads using the uh, Kane and Fisher's uh, formula for the conductance. Uh, I'm sorry, beta acid solution. And we, we see pretty much a similar behavior. We don't have beta ansatz to compare with here. So what we do is we plot uh, I uh, divided by B as a function of B, and we compare with the, the field theoretical uh, solution using bosonization. And we see that the scaling causes a uh, bit to the minus one half, which is what you actually expect from the field. It's really nice. Now let's move on to spinful fermions. And spinful fermions, the setup is very similar, but the physics is quite different. So in the spinful version, we have a left lead again with hopping, and a right lead with hopping T. And they're connected to a quantum dot, the same as before an impurity. But this impurity can have a spin up or spin down, uh, or both. And uh, when you have two electrons sitting on the impurity, you have to pay a, an energy U. Basically, you have a repulsion U when two particles are sitting in the dot. Um, and that's described by the single impurity under small, SI, A, N. So what do so basically you have an hybridization T prime connecting the, the leads to the to the dot. And another ingredient that we use is the gate voltage. This is what they can do the experiments. They can basically tune the gate voltage up and down to move the energy level to the dot. So let's look at the energy diagram of this product. I guess if some of you are familiar already with this product, product but uh, just in case, I'm going to um, Look at it in some more detail. So, so now, we have. So now there's no interaction in the leads? <coughs> no interaction in the leads, yeah. So another thing, you know, th this problem is actually <coughs> better answered, sorry, the condom problem. Right? But if you have interaction in the leads, it's no longer solid. So and, and we can do that with the energy. So that's one of the nice things with the energy. You can add interactions, you can, uh, in the leads, you can uh, add some complex. Geometries in the center, in the interaction region, it's very versatile. Um, but, you know, as a toy example, which is actually very relevant to experiments, uh, let's look at the condo prop, or the quantum dot. So we have a left reservoir, and I'm showing here, and the energy levels in the left reservoir are filled up to a level mu L, and the right reservoir is filled up to a level mu r. And when I quench the system, I move mu l a little bit up and mu r a little bit down. Now in the dot, we can imagine that in the dot we have um, basically two levels. Uh, we can have one impurity here, and we want to put the second impurity, we have to pay an energy here. And I, I think that we can do with the gate voltage is move, the, move these levels up and down. Right? So naively, what do we expect to see? Uh, 
At least in the linear response regime, we're going to talk about first um, the description of the point in the linear response regime. So what you expect to see is something like this. Um, you have your left reservoir, your right reservoir, and you have these two levels separated by U, and you have this knob here, this bit gate voltage. VG that allows you to move these levels up and down. So the naive expectation would be that every time we have one level crossing the Fermi level in the dot, we're going to have transport that's going to come back. Otherwise, when we're in the middle of the gap here, the system is going to be insulated and we won't have any transport. So if we plug, for instance, expansion of VG the conductance, uh, let's say, I divided by V, we expect to see um, a peak here and a peak here separated by U. And uh, basically, <coughs> something like that, right? Um, um, actually, like this. Um, so minus u over two, u over two. When you're at minus u over two, you cross this level. When you're at plus u over two, you cross this level. And uh, you have two peaks. And these are called Coulomb bouquet peaks. And this is actually what you see in a high temperatures, uh, relatively high. Uh, compared to a temperature, characteristic temperature, which is called the, temp the condo temperature. So, in reality, what you see, let me read all this. In reality, what you see is uh, <coughs> that uh, when you do an experiment, is that one color. Yes. When you uh, run the experiment, what you see is that the conductance does something like this. So the system is conducting in the third window between these two lines. And, uh, and this is what's called the condo effect. How does this uh, happen. So what happens is that we have an electron sitting here. Let's say we spin up. A uh, spin down cannot hop into this level because it has to pay a large energy. But we can have a, a virtual tunneling that happens uh, like this. Uh, this particle spin up. We go to a virtual state here that has higher energy. And spin down can then turn up here. And you're back in a low energy state. What happens in this sort of virtual tunneling is that the spin of the the the, the, the electron sitting at the field can be split. And this creates a, what's called the condo signal. This virtual state is a, what's called a condo signal. And this leads to um, a virtual level here at the at the Fermi edge. So this is a now a virtual level that the electrons can use to hold through. And and the hence you get this this perfect conductance. Any questions? So now that we know the phenomenology, the phenomenology of the this condo problem, we can uh, simulate it with the MRG and see how well uh, the machine performs. So, first we're, looking, we're going to look at the non interacting limit. Non interacting limit is, is very simple. Just u equals zero, you can solve it exactly. So, what we're doing here is we're 
on exact localization in very large systems. We are comparing, trying to benchmark BMRG, uh, and we see that as we, uh, for, for different values of the, the, the bytes. And um, it behaves really well. Uh, large biases, we see that um, DMRC starts departing from the, from, the, from the exact solution. Now, why do you think this is happening? Let's look at the pretty confusing lessons here. We are keeping a truncation error of 10 to the minus 7. We start with 200 states. And then we grow the number of states to keep the truncation error under control. But at one point, the number of states is too large. And what do we do? Instead of uh, in keep increasing, we just stop there and say we continue using 1,000 states. And that's a no-no, okay? You don't want to do that. Because then the simulation is not, not quasi exact. So as long as the truncation error is under control, we can say whatever we want about the time interval. So here we get some nice plateaus and we can measure. Here there's another example in which uh, the tunneling, so the TQ that I uh, described before, T prime, is uh, smaller. And for smaller tunneling, the system behaves more, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the for, for small tunneling, the, look at the scale. So here we go from 0 to 20 pretty much, here from 0 to 5. So for small tunneling, we don't develop very nice plateaus. Uh, we have to go to very large systems. So this is uh, 96 sites. And you can see that uh, not even for 96 sites, we get really, you know, a nice smooth plateau where you can say, okay, we measure here. So you have to keep these considerations into account. Small tunnelings are bad. You know, you, you want to use reasonably large tunneling uh, to, 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 do, to study your, your problem. Uh, this, this parameter gamma, sorry, I forgot to mention, this parameter gamma, this parameter gamma is, uh, it's a 2 pi density of states at the Fermi level of the leads. Um, times uh, t prime square, so t, t, yeah, t prime square. t prime is the tunneling hopping. Um, this is the density of states of the leads, and uh, if we have tie binding leads. This is just uh, uh, well, what is it? It's, uh, it's just two t prime square over t. And this is called the hybridization parameter. And if you're looking at on the papers, you're going to see everything described in terms of this hybridization parameter. And the reason is that the condo temperature, Tk, is described as uh, square root of ah, u gamma exponential of some constant pi over 8 uh, gamma over u. Something like that. Gamma over u, u gamma, gamma over u. So, um, U is uh, this U, the, the, the proportion on the dot, and uh, that is the agitation. So you can uh, calculate the condo temperature, is the characteristic temperature that describes the problem. Below the condo temperature, you see condo. Above the condo temperature, you see Coulomb blockade. So here, I'm showing some results for the interacting case. So let me go back to the previous slide and make a um, remark. So imagine that we still want to measure here. We say, OK, yeah, we sort of have a nice plateau. Let's, let's go and measure. What we're going to find is that we're going to have some finite size effects. Maybe the plateau is not stabilized, fully in the steady state, and the system is short, too short to get that, that plateau. Maybe the, steady, the, the, maybe the transit is it's too long and we don't quite reach the steady state. And uh, if we want to measure there, we're going to find some steady and finite size effects. And that's, that translates into these, these results here. So we, we are showing 
the conductance in the linear response uh, regime, so for very small bias, as a function of Vg. Uh, let's look at the black curve first. This is what we expect to see from Condor, but we we need to get a perfect one. That's what this actual solution does. It. And we don't quite reach it, and that's that's the final cycle effect uh, that we uh, uh, described before. In the next few slides, I'm going to tell you how we get rid, how we learn to deal with fine size effects, how we, we we solve the problem of, of fine size uh, deviations using uh, Wilson leads or smooth boundary bridge. So, but here uh, we also see that if we are in, uh, at the magnetic field acting only on impurity, we sort of um, deplete the the condo singlet now into. Uh, uh, two states that have different energies, and um, and that is uh, basically breaks the the, the the singlet apart and leads back to to condo uh, to Coulomb blockade. So a large magnetic field we recover from the Coulomb blockade because we we destroy the virtual state. So how do you uh, access the condo regime? Uh, and we we. I managed to control the fine size effects. And uh, we found that the optimal solution, well, two possibilities. One is to use boundary. Yes. Say again, I can feel it. Only on the panel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to access the condom uh, regime without worrying about. Basically, what we want to do is we want a nice steady state. So there are two solutions. One is the one I described before using the damp boundary conditions. But there is a, a very sort of rigorous way to do this, which is using Wilson leads. So if you look at Wilson's review of quantum physics on Kondo, uh, uh, it teaches that um, you can discretize uh, basically the hopping by doing a, basically a transformation. To uh, another, a new lead that has uh, hopping uh, that goes as lambda to the minus the position divided by two. So basically, the hopping in, this is in real space. The hopping will decrease as you go move away from the from the um, And the parameter that is going to control this the way it decreases is this lambda. For large lambda, it will decrease very fast. And uh, for small, for lambda equal to one, you get you recover the uniformity. Yes. Sorry, I didn't understand that. I thought this is what you meant by damped boundary conditions. It's sort of the same. It's the same, but this is more like rigorous in terms of I don't know. You know, you can teach to observe all the physics, and it, and it works better than damped boundary conditions. It's sort of damped boundary conditions, but using a different parameterization of the boundaries. Uh, and if you plot the, the sort of the density of states or the energy levels in the lead, you see that uh, you know in, in a minus two cosine um, uh, dispersion, you have energy levels oh, equal, uh, equally spaced around the formula, uh, and uh, they will only uh, accumulate up here and down here because of the curvature of the bar. And here is the other way around. All the energy levels uh, sort of are denser near the Fermi level and give you a very good resolution near the Fermi level. And that's what you want right, to describe uh, the, the physics around the Fermi level. So here I'm showing you a um, plot for uniform leads. This is a position uh, along the, the chains. Uh, this is time. And I'm showing the density, the local density. And you see that it's a nice light cone starting at T0, that light cone, and propagates linearly with constant velocity, with perfect velocity. Then the wave packet bounces back, and you get all these, these diamonds that are actually the, the current going back and forth. Um, and we see that if we want to measure steady state, we have to do it in this window between 0 and 10. Now, we add with some leads, you can see what happens. Uh, basically, the current starts flowing in both directions, but instead of flowing with a constant velocity, 
velocity changes. Eventually, the, the charges sort of, they don't freeze, but they start accumulating in the box. And that, again, gives you a um, nice, nice range of time to, to do the measurements. Let's see how this works. Um, here I'm showing you the, um, the conductance as a function of view, the, the, the interaction in the unit for different values of lambda. If we take uniform leads, uh, and this is also at the particle flow symmetric pole, so here, Vg Q to, to minus U over 2. Um, so what we see is that um, uh, for, for uniform leads, we, we should recover one. We should always get one. That's what we expect, no matter what u we use, the value of the, the interaction. And we see that for, for uniform leads, we don't get, we don't even get there. I mean, oh, maybe for a small u, but not quite. So the final size effects are very, very strong. This is really you know, a bummer. Yeah. But if you use uh, Wilson leads, you see a very nice u out to very large, uh, a very nice one to very large lights. <coughs> So let's look at the conductance. Of, um, well, I don't have the conductance much of time. Maybe later. Um, here we're looking at the entropy uh, growth. So um, as a function of uh, time, and we see that as we increase the lambda, uh, the, the entropy actually increases. So we need to use more states. But it doesn't increase uh, dramatically. It's always under control, and it remains pretty constant in time. It's not that bad. Here are results comparing DMRG with beta ansatz for different values of VG. And we see very, very good agreement. So uh, now we're going to move um, away from linear response. And we're going to look at a uh, parameter regime where we have, uh, we have basically out of equilibrium. So we apply very large voltage uh, biases. This is the V here. And we look at the current. And here we compare to a variety of methods. Uh, the dots correspond to um, uh, the time dependent DMRG. And the curves correspond to functional RG, which is uh, basically a very good perturbative method. And, uh, and then there's one curve here, which is in batch lines, which uh, corresponds to perturbation theory up to fourth order. So we see a very good agreement with functional RG. So the question here is uh, whether you know, DMRG is very good or FRG is really good. Uh, so FRG people are definitely very happy. Um, the other methods that have been uh, proposed and are potentially very powerful in the literature, uh, we compare to those methods too. Um, the most relevant one, I guess, and to mention is um, um, a Green's function Monte Carlo in, in uh, real time. So um, you can basically, the diagrammatic, not Green function, sorry, diagrammatic Monte Carlo. You can do uh, perturbation expansions in terms of diagrams, and sum up these diagrams stochastically uh, using Monte Carlo, and you get very good agreement with, uh, with our resource. Right? So, this is a particle from symmetric point. Uh, this is a uh, finite magnetic fields, and we see again very, very good agreement. Uh, and this is again against uh, compared to functional RG. And here we compare, we show very large biases again, the different <coughs> system sizes. So one thing that uh, I need to mention maybe is that the larger the bias, the shorter is the transient, and we can measure in smaller systems. We don't have to go to very large systems. So the MRG works better in small systems than large systems and large biases. That's one thing. Uh, 
And the other thing is that um, the Wilson leads are very helpful in linear response when you want to recover condom, but the large biases, they don't, they don't contribute much. I mean, they don't help much. Because you're very far from the Fermi level, you don't care too much about what's going on at the Fermi level, and uniform leads behave as well as, as Wilson leads. Uh, so for, for out of the equilibrium representation. So now let's look at uh, different games that you can play. We don't necessarily have to start with uh, the ground state. That's something that I told you in the beginning. We can start from any arbitrary state and apply bias, and, and eventually we're going to reach a steady state. The question is, are there good states and bad states? Do we want to stay from? Do you want to start from a nice state where you can avoid the transient, and uh, that would be nice, uh, or you know have shorter transient, or um, uh, so we, we we play with a few tricks here. Um, this is a very elementary experiment. Actually, were run by Fabian Eidenmeier after a paper by Peter Schmidegger, which he also played with this, and. Um, so the idea is that uh, we start from three possible initial states. The initial state A is the one we've been using. Take the ground state, bias it. The initial state B is the other way around. We start from a bias state and move back to zero. And the third state is start from a non-interacting uh, uh, situation with u equal to zero and turn on the U at some time T. And the final Hamiltonian you used to evolve is always the same. The question is, do you reach the same state? How fast do you reach it? How efficiently do you do that? How how the transients decay? So we can see that in states A and B behave very similarly, no difference. And state three, uh, C, that's pretty much what we expect. It evolves as U goes to zero and then uh, when you turn on the U, it goes back to the to the state state of respect for the interacting case. Here I'm showing the computational cost uh, in terms of entropy growth. So I'm showing the, the, the entropy for a block, this is one one human one Neumann's entropy. And uh, as a function of uh, the time. And we see that for, for small biases, and we, as we expect, uh, you know, I, I told you before that small bias is not quite an adiabatic uh, perturbation, but quite, on, on, almost, almost adiabatic. So uh, you expect that the entropy will grow very slow. And that's actually what happens. But as you crank up the bias, the entropy will start growing faster. And the uh, linear time. Here I'm showing you the computational cost uh, for different initial conditions. Again, we take states A, states B, and state C, and we we look at the evolution of the entropy as a function of time. And let's look at the entropy once we reach the sort of quasi steady state. So here we are in a here we are, in this region, we are in the steady state. You see that even though we are in a steady state and we are reaching the current that remains pretty much constant, the system is still propagating, and the light cone is still opening up right here, and the entropy will keep growing. So in the steady state, the entropy keeps growing. That's the message. So that's something that, you know, ideally would like to to so avoid that, uh, how do you do that? So uh, there are several approaches to to tackle this this uh, this entropy growth. Uh, I mean, let me see. So one approach uh, has been proposed is to use um, scattering states. Uh, that was proposed by Nathan Andre, uh, followed up by some papers using the numerical randomization group. And the idea is that you take your leads and you write down your basis. They are not interacting. Right? You know everything about the leads. 
So you, you use the basis for the links in terms of scattering states. And the scattering states actually have a direction. They're moving from left to right. And you have scattering states moving from right to left. And if you use scattering states, uh, sort of like you, you, already, you, can, you can already start from a steady state. And this is a linear response. Or you can apply a quench turning on um, the, the U, the interaction, and the transits are going to be much more. And you're going to reach a steady state faster. So that's, that's basically what we expect. Problem, of course, is that it's limited to problems where you, you have no interactive bits, which is pretty good already. So, uh, that's a nice development. And the other development that uh, has uh, a lot of promise is uh, been actually proposed by, by Matt Hastings, which is uh, uh, it's basically uh, what he called the, the light cone matrix prospects. So basically, it's a way to similar to METs, to, to um, Steve's METs for thermal evolution. Uh, he can do some combination of sampling and time evolution using matrix flow states for DMRG that basically disentangle the system. And you do projective measurements, you have to do statistics on it. And that has uh, a lot of potential, I believe. Uh, have to learn how to do it. Um, so I think um, I finished traveling, but everybody's hungry, I'm sure. So I see some smiles. Is that good or bad? OK. I want to thank you for your attention, and um, tomorrow we continue with the uh, uh, hands-on tutorial. Thank you.